Good evening, everyone. I'm John Holler, the president of the museum. And on behalf of the trustees and our staff and our members and donors, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second of our two events uh, during this special inaugural week of our affiliated historian program. I especially want to thank all of you who ran the gauntlet of our construction project. You saw a little bit about Revolution just a minute ago. We're extremely excited about this. It's going to be a one of a kind uh, history exhibit related to uh, the history of computing and everything it's meant to society. But we are a little bit disrupted right now. And so if you, uh, those of you who just ignored the sign in front that said danger, do not enter, and came around to the side and are actually here this evening, uh, we're grateful to you for that. I especially want to thank everyone who is here from Thai, uh, because Thai are good friends of the museum and our partners for this event tonight. And in a moment, I'm going to ask Vish Mishra to come to the stage for a formal welcome to all of you. Before I do that, uh, there are several people that I'd like to thank briefly tonight as we get this program underway. First, I want to thank Dr. Michael Riordan, who is the adjunct professor of physics at UC Santa Cruz and a lecturer in the history of the philosophy of science at Stanford University. We have something here at the museum called the Semiconductor Special Interest Group. Michael is an active member of that, and he was instrumental in envisioning and setting up this affiliated historian program several months ago. The entire semi-sig, as we call it, has been incredibly supportive, and I want to thank them and the staff director of the semi-sig, Rosemary Romaley, for their effort. And I also want to thank senior curator Dag Spicer for his help in putting the program together. Second, I want to say thank you to the IEEE Santa Clara Valley section and to Dick Ahrens, who is a member of the executive committee, uh, for their generosity in helping to generate the funding for this lecture series and for the affiliated historian program. Uh, the section was joined in its funding by the IEEE Foundation as a joint sponsor of these events, and I want to be sure and say thank you to the Foundation as well. Many of you who are here from Thai tonight may not know this, but we have someone very important in common, and in fact he's here tonight, uh, Suhas Patil. Suhas was not only instrumental in the founding of Thai, as you know, but you may not know he was also a charter board member of the museum. Uh, and he only left the board last year when his service was made unworkable by his constant travel between Bangalore and San Jose, which is a trip that is uh, a long commute back and forth. So uh, we hope that when Suhas is finished with that, he will come back to us and we can welcome him back to the board one day soon. The official Thai welcome tonight will be made by a man who uh, was proudly identified by the San Jose Mercury News as the top connector in the valley, the top connector in the valley, and in a place where people making connections with other people is a kind of stock and trade, that's saying something. Uh, and Vish has also just been part of a very important announcement that will link up angel investors and Thai entrepreneurs in the venture community in the valley, which is, I think, a real breakthrough. He is in the middle of a very distinguished 30-year career in the high-tech industry. Uh, he's done everything from startups to what he calls mentor capital, which I think is a brilliant phrase, at Clearstone Venture Partners. And I'm going to welcome him to the stage for the Thai welcome. Please uh, give a welcome to Vish Mishra. So I have only 59 seconds uh, to extend my welcome. Anyway, I really feel um, very humbled and also intimidated in a way. Uh, sitting or standing in, in front of you, all the brainiacs in this room, you know, IIT and MIT and uh, I don't know how many other ITs are here in this room. Uh, so anyway, it's, 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 again, it's, it's a sheer delight and I'll just say it's Rosemary's insistence really paid off. That's what really brought us together. Uh, several months ago, she contacted me. I said, come on over to Thai office. And Kiran Malhotra, Rosemary, and myself, we sat together and we kind of you know, designed this kind of program. And so this is, this is as a result of that. So I think uh, she deserves um, you know, um, just uh, um, you know, our, our thanks uh, for that. Um, Thai, there are many, many, you know, um, we already mentioned Suhas Patil's name, okay, he's a, one of the Thai founders and Thai first president, and I feel, you know, very humble that uh, I'm, uh, you know, following in his footsteps. I'm the sixth president here of Thai Silicon Valley. Uh, many, uh, a couple of our board members are here, uh, Murli Rangrajan and Shankar Trivedi, I saw them in the hall, and many of our Thai charter members are here. So anyway, just a very a brief thing about Thai. Um, 
We started Thai uh, now almost 18 years ago, right here in Silicon Valley, and it was started by those people who are, uh, um, you know, they came to America from primarily South Asian countries, India and Pakistan in particular, and they kind of realized their American dream and uh, you know, saw a level of success, and they said, gee, won't that be nice if we form a society and help others, anybody who wants to be you know, entrepreneurs? And that's how Tai began, and you know, little that they know, they knew that time or we knew, now we are into 13 countries, 55 cities, uh, across five continents, and there are 15,000 members. So this organization is all individual member based. It's all volunteer based, and uh, you know, you know, we just continue to do. Um, uh, you know, our whole thing is to just provide service to others. So we're really a service organization, and we stand to help others. Anybody who wants to become an entrepreneur, they could come to Thai for inspiration, for information, for education. Uh, as well as help with you know preparation for their ventures, and uh, as we just launched uh, a program where they could also now get some uh, much needed seed capital to put them on the first um, uh, you know rung of the success ladder, as we call it. So once again, I'm just very honored, and I'm uh, I, I know you guys are going to enjoy this uh, this discussion that's going to take place tonight. So just welcome one more time, and thank you very much for you know having me over um, Computer History Museum, Rosemary. Thank you. If uh, there could be a subtitle to tonight's event, maybe it would be something like uh, The Professor Meets the Practitioner. There's really nothing better than to get uh, an academician and an entrepreneur and a, and a successful corporate executive together because uh, the sparks often fly and we're, we're confident that that's what's going to happen tonight. Uh, I said uh, on Tuesday night when we kicked this event off that visiting scholars are an important part of any great research institution. Uh, this museum supports an enormous amount of research every year into many aspects of computing, entrepreneurship, technology, startups, uh, history, and the incredible impact that computing has had on our society. Uh, even though we support a, a lot of research, until now we really haven't had the capacity to host our own technology historian in residence, uh, but that has been an ambition of ours, and tonight it's an ambition that is fully realized. Happily, with the support of the IEEE and the willing participation of Dr. Ross Bassett, we are able to launch our affiliated historian program this week. Uh, Ross has all the bumps and bruises that are customary for somebody who is the first one at anything. And I know we have a lot of entrepreneurs uh, in the audience tonight. So if you can think of a, of a historian and academic entrepreneur uh, taking his bumps, that would be Ross. But he's done it with great good spirit and collegiality, and Ross, we appreciate that very, very much. Dr. Ross Bassett is the director of the Benjamin Franklin Scholars Program at North Carolina State University. He received his undergraduate degree in electrical engineering from the University of Pennsylvania, his master's in history at Cornell, and a PhD in history from Princeton. His work in the technology field includes eight years as an engineer in IBM Semiconductor Facility in East Fishkill, New York, before he began his graduate study. He writes extensively and he speaks frequently and he blogs on a variety of topics related to the intersection of history and technology, and his work in this field has been supported by the IEEE's Life History Fellowship. His first lecture and discussion uh, here on Tuesday focused on his book, To the Digital Age, Research Labs, Startup Companies, and the Rise of MOS Technology. Tonight, we continue with Dr. Bassett in conversation with T.M. Ravi to discuss the proud history of Indian graduates of MIT, how they helped create the Indian Institutes of Technology, modern technological India and South Asia, and the important role that they play in the worldwide technology scene. T.M. Ravi is a very successful Valley executive and a very successful entrepreneur. He founded Media Blitz, a storage solution company which was subsequently acquired by Cheyenne Software. He was a senior marketing executive at CA after its acquisition of Cheyenne. He left that to found and lead the VC-backed company Peakstone and then he went on to found a wonderful uh, company involved in the state-of-the-art of data archiving 
Mimosa Systems, which was acquired in February by Iron Mountain for $112 million. So Ravi has lived the Silicon Valley dream over and over. And so you can see when I say the professor tonight meets the practitioner, uh, that's exactly what we have in store. So please join me in welcoming our first affiliated historian, Dr. Ross Bassett, and his guest, entrepreneur T.M. Ravi. Hi, Ross. <laughs> Good to see you. So Ross was here on Tuesday evening mm -hmm. and, and with an esteemed, uh, uh, a different crowd, a, a big crowd from Intel also. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, it's, a, it's an interesting combination because Ross is a historian who's, uh, I guess, writing about the very early days. You know, I was probably four or five years old living in, in IIT Kanpur. And, and many of you, and I see many people here who in some sense lived that history, and, and you're putting it all together at a, at a macro level. What, what really, um, it, it was, for me, it was very unusual to, to come across uh, you with um, you know, the deep interest in India, uh, Indian technology, and tying it together to MIT. Mm. Uh, talk to me a little bit about how you got interested in this. Yeah. So a couple of things. I think one of the jobs of the historian is to tell how we got where we are today. How did, um, how did today's world come about? And it's sort of also to look at things that we wouldn't have expected in the, in the past, that if we had uh, gone back 60 years, say, ago, and uh, said some, somebody, you know, the world, what, told them about the world of 2010 that they would be surprised about. And I think one of the things I think that people would be surprised about if we said 60 years ago, well, there would be, um, you know, Indian entrepreneurs would be some of the leading uh, economic engines of uh, the United States. Um, that would have surprised people if we would have said that um, Indian uh, companies would be doing a lot of high technology work for American companies. That, that would have surprised people. So that, that's one of the things I'm interested in. Another thing that I think of as a historian is that you should have some passion for what you do and care about it a lot. And I've been interested in India for a long time, and India has kind of followed me. When I was in high school, I uh, first got interested in Gandhi and read his autobiography. And when I was in college, I had some friends, and I heard about these uh, Indian Institutes of Technology that I had never heard of before. This was in the late 1970s. And I heard about these number of these places being formed. And actually, when I was in, uh, in I, after I finished college, I visited India, and I was in Bangalore. This was a sleepy sort of uh, town, very uh, green, not, not very many cars you know, on, on the roads or anything. And I remember waiting at a bus stop, and I met this guy, I saw this guy who had a deck PDP-11 manual in his hand, uh, uh, an in Indian. And I don't think there was a way I could have invested in that at the time, but if I had been a little bit smarter, I might have seen what was coming. And so uh, I've had this interest, and uh, it seemed like the right combination of the interest and what uh, has happened in the intervening time to make this project make sense. And you've been there many times. Yeah, so I, I've had, I'm working on two things, the IITs and then also the history of Indian graduates of MIT. And so I've been to India about 10 times in the last three years and traveling to all the, I, the original IITs and then also meeting uh, Indian graduates of, of, um, of MIT as well. And so, um, uh, you you were an IIT Kanpur graduate, right? Yeah. And so uh, you can correct me if I'm ever wrong about anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was interesting for me personally because um, I um, lived, I, I was born here in, in the U.S. because my father, uh, like a lot of other professors in the IITs, mm. were actually in the U.S. and got recruited mm. to, to go back to India. And so I lived on um, the IIT Kanpur campus since uh, 1965, mm. and then subsequently did my 
a bachelor's degree in, in Kanpur before I came here to UCLA. Mm -hmm. So, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So, so let's let's kind of maybe get started with the with the MIT connection, mm -hmm. and and so I understand um, that there was a MIT connection that that really goes back way to the pre you know pre-independence for the mm -hmm. during the colonial times. Mm -hmm. Can I talk talk to talk to us a little bit about it. Yeah. So this was something that was kind of surprising to me that I thought I was interested in Indian graduates of MIT, and I thought I would be talking mostly about people like uh, Suhas Patil and uh, people li like that, or you might know uh, Thomas Kailath at, at Stanford, people uh, of, of that type. Or, uh, um, but so I made this database of every Indian who graduated from MIT in the 20th century and was surprised to find that uh, there were a number of Indians who went to MIT in the colonial period. And, uh, and in Indian history in the early uh, 20th century, uh, there were, was the beginning of an organized uh, opposition to British, uh, uh, a new phase of organized opposition to uh, British rule, and often uh, seen as started in Calcutta with the Swadeshi movement. And a lot of uh, people uh, began looking to the United States and trying to um, see, saw the United States as a place where they could develop the technical skills to uh, really help develop India. And so it was uh, a number of people went, came to the United States, some to MIT and even some to uh, Berkeley. There was an interesting article that I found written in 1909 by an Indian saying why we must come to the United States. And they talked about why we need to come to get technical education um, in the United States. So there were a number of Indians who, who um, saw this as really the future. And I get, one of the things, the lessons I take from this is that people in India, the Swadeshi movement was partially about um, making um, Indians making their own cloth and um, avoiding uh, British manufacturers and things like that. But there was really this passion for developing, you could say, a world-class um, knowledge and world-class standards in, in this. And what they saw is the best engineering education they saw. Uh, was in the in the United States, so that was really what um, what drove them. And and was there a specific connection to MIT that? Uh... Well, th I think they saw. I guess you know, using um, 21st century t terminology, uh, I think one thing was the information bandwidth between the United States and India was so low that they saw uh, MIT was the premier uh, American technological institution, and that was really what made an initial connection. I found that there was one um, Indian man in the 1890s who went to Cambridge in the UK, and he had met a famous economist uh, named Alfred Marshall. And Alfred Marshall told this uh, young Indian, he said, um, you Indians should not be going to Cambridge, and you shouldn't be studying law you should go to MIT and become entrepreneurs. And this, um, and um, th it was, uh, you know, a rather prophetic thing. And this, this, um, this uh, man uh, took it very seriously. And he brought up a whole generation of people and took them, encouraged them to go to MIT, his uh, um, family members and, uh, and, and others. The one, one would sort of, if you thought about uh, Gandhi, mm. one, one would sort of probably naively assume that he would be against technology, mm. against all the quote unquote modernity mm. that came with technology. Mm. But but that's really not quite the case. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the other intriguing things that I found um, was that there was a young man who was uh, grew up in Gandhi's ashram um, with Gandhi. Um, and Gandhi at one point said, uh, I raised this young man. He was, his name was Bal Kalelkar. And um, he marched with Gandhi on the Salt March. He was involved in many activities with Gandhi. And um, in 1939, uh, after all this time working with Gandhi, um, he went to MIT to get a, a master's degree in mechanical engineering. And, you know, it seems like you know, one of the, the craziest things. Um, I've been looking at Gandhi's uh, letters. He wrote many letters. And he 
was in some ways, um, it might be a little of a stretch, but he was very technically oriented that is spinning he kept in his diary, he kept uh, um, often daily uh, reports of how many rounds he spun. He um, sponsored a, a contest to develop improved uh, charkas or spinning wheels um, that he was very passionate about this spinning and very uh, technologically, uh, you know, uh, he was not naive and so uh, I can understand in a, in a way that his public image was in some sense being um, against modernity, but someone who lived with him, like this young man, Baal Kalelker, I kind of imagine that they might see this different side, and even though they hear Gandhi say things maybe about spinning, they see his life and how interested he is in technology, and they, um, they see sort of the national, the logical extension of that would be to be an engineer and go to MIT, and so, uh, so that's uh, that's what he did. And, and so I guess as as we we kind of come down to the independence of of India, mm -hmm. um, Nehru, uh, who who was uh, very progressive, who had gone to school in mm -hmm. in England, um, became uh, a leading figure, and and then the first prime minister. And, and played a big role in, in, uh, in promoting science and, and technology. Yeah. And so I guess you have a good perspective on that from your, from your grandfather. Yeah, so you know, my grandfather, um, uh, his name was uh, Sir K.S. Krishnan, and he was in Rangoon, and then you know, the, India started shrinking because of, um, uh, you know, it was getting close to independence, and, and then he went to Dhaka, and then became difficult. And then he went to Allahabad, and he got lucky there. You've got you to work hard in life, but you've got to get lucky. <laughs> and so he had a neighbor whose name was Nehru, who they used to go for walk together every day. And one day Nehru became prime minister. And he said, hey, I, I, where's my friend? And he said, OK, I'm going to open a series of institutes, and they're called National Physical Laboratories, NPL. And so my grandfather went to Delhi to be the first director there. <laughs> so, so, so let's let's kind of go to now. We are, we are in the sort of the early 50s, mm. and 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 so India is beginning to look at um, education, mm. and 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 specifically um, science and technology, mm. and 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 so through the Sarkar Commission, mm. through the efforts of Nehru, this this whole the concept. Uh, the idea mm -hmm. of, of IITs comes about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Talk, to, talk yeah. to us about that. And so I guess this uh, commission, the Sarkar Commission, is, is very famous for laying out the foundation of the IITs. And one of the interesting things about that that is not very well known, th there was this commission that had a number of leading, and um, again, uh, Ravi's family sort of testifies to this great scientific tradition that India has. Uh, had a number of India's leading scientists um, on it. Uh, but it also had uh, two young men who were not very well known uh, to history who were uh, Indians who had gotten their PhDs at, at MIT. And so it was, um, uh, in some ways, I think, you know, they played a role in shaping this and sort of say, you know, suggesting MIT as the model that India would develop. And it, again, it really, I think, testifies to uh, India's desire to develop world uh, institutions that met world standards, that were world-class institutions that would uh, not just be, um, you know, uh, serve India, but really would, would reach the standards of the world, and that's, you know, really what they did. And uh, so that was very important. And then uh, ultimately these uh, initially uh, five IITs, of course, were started with um, with uh, assistance from different national patrons. And, and that, that was interesting because you had different countries, mm. you know, uh, United States supporting Kanpur. Mm. How, how did that come about with different countries supporting different IITs? Yeah, so it seems like uh, Nehru and the Indian government was very shrewd. Uh, Nehru, of course, had this policy of non-alignment. Alignment. Yeah, and so was able to uh, get support from um, 
from many different countries to uh, develop this, that Karugpur had a number of different countries uh, supporting uh, it, and then uh, IIT Bombay had the Soviets, and IIT Delhi, the British, um, IIT Kanpur, the Americans, and IIT Madras, the Germans. Uh, West Germans, yeah. And um, so I guess you uh, grew up with a fairly strong uh, American presence in Kanpur. Yeah, so, so uh, it, was, it, was, it was very uh, interesting and unusual because uh, I don't know, many, uh, some of you are from uh, IIT Kanpur. Kanpur is, is really in the middle of nowhere. Uh, uh, a sort of a town that had its, um, its it's a textile town mm. uh, that was great in probably uh, the early 1900s. <laughs> and, and so in the middle of um, Uttar Pradesh in, in Kanpur, um, they decided, I don't know how they chose Kanpur mm. as, as the place. Mm. And, and so Kanpur had, um, as part of the, uh, the program, uh, a fair number of Americans mm -hmm. living living on the campus, mm -hmm. and and it was just an oasis out there. It had a uh, it had a uh, it had a whole um, uh, runway with planes, and I don't know how many universities you know here that have planes mm -hmm. <laughs> and runways, and mm -hmm. and and there was a reason they had to do that because they were t they had to bring in equipment and mm -hmm. uh, from for different physics labs and mm -hmm. computer labs and mm -hmm. and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the early early days of of um, the different IITs, mm. um, and I, you know, you you have a broader perspective. Mine, mine is just related to Kanpur. Mm. How how do you see, how did it how did it kind of take off? How did you know mm. from kind of the concept stage? You know, how did it become real? Yeah. So of course, uh, Karagpur was the first um, IIT, and so they, um, and I think a lot of them again. In a sense, um, I think especially from the Indian side, a lot of them saw MIT as the model, even if their sponsor was not the United States, that MIT was really what they aspired to. And so that was played a big role in a lot of the, the IITs that I was speaking to um, Suhas the other day, and he was mentioning how uh, MIT books were in the curriculum at uh, Kragpur, and so uh, that that was important, I think, in, in all the IITs. And also in all the IITs, even um, if they had foreign sponsors, that really right after independence, that um, Indians who went abroad for education uh, it was almost like a, a switch had been flipped that uh, before, you know, many had gone to the UK to, you know, get education and various sorts, but almost right after independence, it, it shifted to the United, United States. States. And so there were a lot of um, Indians um, who ended up at any, all of the IITs who had had their education in America, and they really uh, understood a lot about American uh, technology and how American technical education was. So um, even though um, they might have um, taught at, say, IIT Bombay or IIT Delhi. They still had a good understanding and in some ways brought American ideas of uh, technical education to those schools. And, and, and uh, Kanpur, at least, you know, had a whole set of universities and, mm. uh, backing it. MIT was, was one of them, yeah. but there were a number of others. Yeah, yeah so there were n nine American universities who supported um, IIT Kanpur and just um, as a little bit of uh, kind of local color, they, um, MIT was sort of the anchor for this, and there were three uh, MIT professors who went to Kanpur, and uh, they got excited about the possibilities of supporting IIT Kanpur, and they came back and said, let's have a, a project where uh, we get different American universities involved. And so they approached uh, 10 American universities and say, would you, you know, support a program like this? Would you get involved? Would you maybe send faculty? And nine American universities said yes, and one American university said no, we don't want to be involved in that. And the one American university that said no was Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps one of the major beneficiaries yeah. of the IIT. So I mean, and I think, yeah, of all the uh, all the ways that Stanford has benefited from the IITs, it's. Um, but uh, maybe they realized they didn't. They would get the benefit whether they supported it or not. So <laughs> they could be the free rider. And, and so, and uh, as as we are in the 60s, 
um, the, the US had an aid program called the PL480, mm. where um, India you know, was going through some rough times. There was mm. um, a food shortage and mm. starvation, and, mm. and this was a program that, uh, that was put together so that um, the US could, could send wheat and, and other food to India. Mm. But it also resulted in, in the CAP program, mm. and, uh, which is the Kanpur Indo-American program. Mm -hmm. And, and talk, talk to us a little bit about yeah. how that is. So this was a program um, of assistance to uh, Kanpur where it provided um, the KIOP program in addition to providing these faculty provided uh, equipment um, that would go to Kanpur, uh, established a library at Kanpur and, uh, and so on. And then um, so that this really helped Kanpur develop a lot of state of the art facilities. So when you were a student, did you have a sense of you know the the equipment that Kanpur had. Yeah, and, so it as as you point out, um, you know you just look at the like in in, in terms of laser spectrometers in mm -hmm. physics or uh, cryogenics equipment or computers, which which we'll have a chance to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, India, uh, you know, if you looked at, and perhaps this was the advantage of Kanpur being tied to uh, United States and mm -hmm. and universities here because. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kanpur simply um, leveraged the best practices mm -hmm. that were there in Caltech and MIT and, mm -hmm. and uh, Purdue and the different institutes. Mm -hmm. And I think the experience, at least the early experience in, in Madras and, and uh, Bombay <laughs> were different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so uh, as, as um, the computer education, if we can switch now mm -hmm. to kind of talking about Computers. You know, I, I graduated in, in 1982, 77 to 82, the last five-year program in, in uh, IIT Kanpur. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have uh, a program in computer science. We had courses in computer science. Mm -hmm. But the next year, where uh, my good friend who had passed away, Rajiv Muthwani, mm -hmm. went, mm -hmm. the, the year after me, mm -hmm. uh, they had a, a, mm -hmm. a four-year program, and they had a program in computer science. Mm -hmm. And, and so India, very early on, got some IBM computers. Yeah. And I, at Kanpur, the first director was um, P.K. Kelker. And he really had a vision, I think, of uh, technical education, um, what it could be. He seemed to be someone who could really look into the future. And he was really passionate about computing from the very uh, get-go. And so, I mean, it ended up almost simultaneously that um, IIT Kanpur and IIT Kharagpur got, uh, each got IBM uh, 1620 computers that, um, that really were, especially at Kanpur, then integrated very closely into the, into the uh, computing uh, program. And so that they were uh, very important that fr from, I think it's like 1965 that everyone at Kanpur learned how to program a computer. And I think it probably wouldn't have even been the case in the United States that every engineering student, like, I wouldn't imagine that my university, North Carolina State, everyone would have learned how to program at that date. So, I mean, it was very advanced. Um, it just um, going back, did you have a strong, uh, sense of Dr. Kelker when you were uh, there? So I was you were young. A, a type, <laughs> and, I guess, and, and so uh, clearly, um, uh, Dr. Kelker had influence not just in f the founding of IIT Kanpur, but mm. subsequent to that, he went to IIT Bombay. Mm. Mm. And, and Bombay had the mixed blessing of getting Russian, uh, Soviet support. Mm. But, but Kelker was able to take what he learned from Mm. Kanpur, mm. Uh, you know, because um, not everything worked mm. uh, the way they had planned, mm. uh, and and really start implementing the same kinds of things, mm -hmm. the same uh, syllabus, the same mm -hmm. uh, processes mm. in in uh, in Bombay. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and he, I guess, actually, he had dr uh, helped plan Bombay, then went to Kanpur, and then went. He was from. Bombay, Bombay yes. came back to yes. Bombay after that. And, and so along with these computers that, that came, um, also came, you know, uh, I guess they recruited um, professors mm. um, from the United States mm -hmm. and, and, and developed a, uh, a curriculum of education mm. in, in computer science. Yeah. And so initially, I mean, it's quite remarkable in a sense that there were some 
uh, a number of uh, very prominent professors who went with this computer. One was a man by the name of Harry Husky who was, uh, was involved with the ENIAC, the first computer and really one of the leading, he was a professor at UC Berkeley, really one of the leading figures, a professor at Princeton. Um, um, uh, several uh, professor, uh, people from Princeton, Geo Wiederholt, who was a uh, professor at Stanford, um, who um, really helped get this, get this program going and really played key, key roles in this. And then they were able to recruit a number of faculty um, to run this computer center um, who had been trained in, in the states, uh, um, Raj, Professor Roger Raman, Raja Raman and Professor yeah. Mahabala. Mahabala, yeah. yes. Yeah. And, and, and so if you, if you think about the early uh, books of uh, programming and uh, computer science mm -hmm. in India, um, they, they, there's a Raja Raman yeah. and, and, uh, yeah. and others who, yeah. who developed them. Yeah, and so, they, were, they had an impact beyond just uh, yeah. Kanpur. Yeah, so they, uh, professors Raja Raman and Mahabala were in some ways uh, evangelists for computing. They had a number of courses that people would come to from uh, Kanpur all over India that uh, some of, I don't know if you um, recall this, that they talked about their uh, wives would um, cook meals for the attendees. Uh, some attendees, Kanpur is um, in uh, Kalyanpur, Kalyanpur. Some, some distance, maybe 15 miles from the train yeah. station or so. Some people would um, take uh, ride bikes, bicycle rickshaws from the train station. Like tempo, to, tempo is like a like mm -hmm. a little. <laughs> yeah, and so there was this passion to learn about computing at, uh, from uh, Kanpur. Yeah. And and so the early computers came from from IBM, mm. and and I guess um, IBM was was the supplier of sort of main supplier of computers mm. till till one day sort of uh, it became DEC. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I guess IBM got uh, thrown out of India in 1977, and um, so at that, I think it was at that point when uh, the, when I when Kanpur upgraded that they went to True. digital computers. Yeah, there, there's a, there's um, there's a kind of a, a story there behind IBM, which is that uh, even though uh, places like Kanpur and Kharagpur got computers from IBM they tended to be much older and, and kind of a previous generation, mm. which, um, which was not very thoughtful of IBM. <laughs> and, but it did help ultimately because there wasn't a lot of support, there weren't a lot of tools. Mm. So the people had to get their hands dirty and mm. develop compilers and develop tools. Yeah, and I guess one of the, th I mean, it, one of the, it was, uh, one of the things about the IBM computers were they were fairly, pretty reliable and had uh, standard service IBM maintenance people would come and maintain them. That uh, I, um, Those of you who maybe um, went to IIT Bombay might remember Professor uh, Isaac there who was responsible for the computer center and they had these Soviet computers and they had to uh, do all their own maintenance uh, themselves, that they had to uh, build all these uh, boxes, add-ons, and be very, spend a lot of effort in hardware, and they didn't, weren't really able to spend much time doing uh, programming at, at IIT Bombay and, uh, because of that. Yeah. So which, which kind of, as we, as we get to the, the early 70s, mm. you know, there was a, there was a fairly uh, big presence of Americans in, in Kanpur, mm. IIT Kanpur, and as we get into kind of the early 70s, mm. that's uh, 1972 when, mm. when um, there's the Bangladesh war, mm. and um, India is, um, I guess, finds itself uh, on the other side where the United States and Pakistan mm. are, are very closely allied. Mm. And, and as a result, Indira Gandhi um, has, has really a change in, in her position and her approach. It didn't help that Nixon and Indira Gandhi didn't get along either. <laughs> and, 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 but that impacted um, Kanpur yeah. in, in particular. Yeah. So again, um, and you probably experienced this, and many, maybe many of you in the audience did, again, the relations between the United States and India were, you know, terrible in 72, 73 that um, Richard Nixon um, with the uh, 
war in Bangladesh sent the uh, aircraft carrier Enterprise into the Bay of Bengal in a, uh, what was sort of a hostile gesture to India and uh, things really fell apart between the United States and India. And this program um, with the Kanpur Indo-American program kind of had a very hard landing, you could say. Abrupt, that, yes. Yeah, that it, there was some thought it could be continued on and maybe gradually phased out, have different aspects, but it came to a very uh, harsh ending, whereas the other programs, IIT Madras, Bombay, Delhi, had maybe um, more graceful conclusions. Uh, but at the same time, I think um, a lot of Indian uh, p faculty at, IIT, at the IITs, you know, still saw their connections, uh, the technological connections as being important with the United States and even though the formal relations deteriorated, the informal relations were still... Because people close. were still going uh, to and fro for conferences and yeah. students were going and, yeah. and there were new faculty members and perhaps uh, uh, mixed blessing again mm. because um, in some sense, these uh, American professors mm -hmm. had done their work, mm -hmm. and and so it was now um, an opportunity for for the Indian professors yeah. to take it to the next level. Yeah, and in a sense, I think what I've heard is that America, maybe as America often does, had a bigger footprint at Kanpur than any of the other foreign programs, and so it it might have just been time for. That uh, uh, that to end, yeah. So so tell me what what you um, what you found out about sort of the you know these these five IITs mm. you know uh, very elite institutions mm. um, and almost you know where where the professors the students had a sense of um, um, there was a mission. Mm. It was, uh, it was the, the, think about you know Kanpur in, in this little mm. village Kalyanpur mm. was a utopia, mm. and 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 uh, there was a dream. Mm. And uh, how 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 did you how yeah. do you see that? Yeah, again, you see this passion of Indian uh, professors, and maybe uh, you could talk about your father in th this regard. But that you have these Indian faculty members uh, very often at Kanpur, especially pulled back from the United States who have positions um, often in various forms and really have a passion to build India and really just committed to uh, that science and technology are going to, to build this, this country and really, uh, again, going to, you know, Kalyanpur, Kanpur, um, I imagine maybe for your father might be the last place that they might have imagined they would from the south of india <laughs> yeah would be and just being willing to do that for you know the sake of developing science and technology is uh, did your father have that sense of mission so, the, so if you if you saw um, there uh, there was there was almost uh, uh, you know india had just become independent it was mm. barely 20 years mm. since uh, independence you know 15 years mm. and that there was just a sense that we were creating something new mm. and uh, we were going to not go to england the colonial mm. power but we were going to the source of where it was the mm. best mm. and i think i think one could make a pretty strong claim that the IITs are much better known and much better established than any engineering institution in England mm. or United mm -hmm. Kingdom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so let's let's um, kind of uh, move away from IIT, switch switch gears to the Indian IT um, industry, mm. and and so there were um, a lot of ties to to MIT, mm. and and there's uh, for example Tata. What's yeah. So, I mean, even when the IITs were started, um, you had, in, in the 50s and 60s especially, I mean, that MIT still had a strong uh, hold on India, that you see many people uh, going to MIT, that many uh, people from India's business families would send their, um, India's business families would often send their heirs to uh, MIT. And one of the intriguing things is that um, TCS, the Tata Consultancy Service, was started by uh, three young MIT graduates um, who had gone to MIT, got interested in computing, 
And um, one of them had some connections with Tata management, and they convinced the Tatas to uh, start them up, these young guys in their 20s. And you know, they've described to me this is not the typical way things run in India, where you know, 25-year-olds are given you know, sort of the keys to the company and just told, you know, uh, take over. And they started this um, consultancy to um, develop computers for um, Tata businesses and other companies. Um, they ran into some problems, and Tata management um, replaced them ultimately. And the person they brought in to replace them was another MIT graduate, um, F.C. Coley. And so uh, MIT, really, these MIT graduates, F.C. Coley, was someone who was very big on uh, systems approach um, and really helped develop Tata into the uh, IT power that it, that it um, has become today. So that, and uh, Mr. Coley, um, and I've met him a number of times, and I always think of him as Mr. Coley, um, uh, had a lot of connections to the United States, I think partially from his time at uh, MIT. He was the first Indian um, member of the IEEE Board of Directors, and so he had a lot of connections. He ultimately was able to get uh, Tata connected up with Burroughs, and that was really their first big business in the United States um, that they did uh, Tata Burroughs and then develop it, doing IT work for Burroughs Computers. So that was fair. And, and then you had uh, Putney yeah. and, and Infosys. Yeah. And, and I guess I don't. I'm not sure um, how well known the story of Infosys is. It's sort of a Silicon Valley story, you could say, in a, a certain sense. Um, that uh, Narendra Putney was an MIT graduate who had worked for uh, Jay Forrester, the great uh, MIT entrepreneur who developed core memory and um, uh, did many other things. And he b got this vision for a uh, outsourcing, doing work for uh, American companies in India. And so he developed this company called Putney Computer Systems. They were um, marketing data general computers, doing work for data general. He put together this great team of nine people um, who were top flight engineers. And um, I think as maybe you all know in Silicon Valley, when you put together a top flight engineers, they're not always happy to stay in one place and sometimes they <laughs> have minds of their own and so this group that Mr. Putney put together um, left and decided they wanted to form their own company and it was called Infosys and um, one of the things though I would say is that these guys even though they were top flight engineers and are uh, icons today um, Narayana Murthy and Nandan Nilakani and um, so on and so forth at the time they would not have been able to have gotten the business um, that uh, Narendra Putney was able to get because of his connections at, at MIT, that he knew through Jay Forrester, he knew many people and was able to make the connections in the United States. And then once these connections had been made um, and um, these, these people had these connections, they could continue on with Infosys. But it wouldn't have worked really without Mr. Putney was sort of the an uh, inadvertent connector of um, the Infosys guys with the American business world. And, and, and you know, prior to, to that, uh, in the 70s, there was a lot of concern about brain drain mm. because um, what was happening is probably 60, 70 percent of, of an IIT class mm. would be going directly to the United States mm. to do their master's or PhD mm. and never come back. Mm. And there was a very significant Mm -hmm. investment that the Indian government was making mm -hmm. in these young uh, students. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't all um, bad for India. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I guess, um, and I think again, many of you here tonight are proof of that. I mean, this whole IIT thing was an act of great faith, you could say, uh, in the in Indian government. Uh, again, uh, br thinking back to 1963 and bringing in computers, it seemed like maybe a crazy thing to do, but ultimately over a very long term that... Computers it, in a country where there's a lot of people and you don't want to automate anything because yeah, I mean, you put people out of work. Yeah, yeah. yeah that it, it seemed like a completely counterintuitive thing to bring computers, labor-saving technology to a country that has an abundance of, of labor. And uh, it was very uh, controversial that some people have described to me how uh, there were uh, protests by labor uh, unions uh, keeping computers from being installed in different locations, and but ultimately it proved to be a very 
uh, successful, successful in uh, technology for India and in some ways the same way with the IITs that there was um, some doubt. I mean, you must have been there. The 70s seemed to be a period of a lot of questioning about are these really worth it? You know, it may be the IITs didn't have quite the reputation in India um, that they do now. Was, did you well, The IITs had a great reputation. The problem was that uh, all the people were coming yeah. here. <laughs> and and so, so, you know, my perspective on, on this is what, what happened, and many people here are, are proof of this, is they came here, they got established in mm. industry and in universities. Mm. And uh, Bangalore and Hyderabad and, and Pune would not have happened mm. if we didn't have the connections and the ties. Mm -hmm. It isn't an accident that India got you know, a lot of the outsourcing offshore business mm. process mm -hmm. uh, work. Um, and you know, China or some other country did. Mm -hmm. It's um, these networks were had been built mm -hmm. over 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, you see, this was in the United States in the 1960s, early 1960s was a very idealistic time in the United States. I think uh, President Kennedy. Um, this program really developed with uh, President Kennedy and um, John Kenneth Galbraith was the American ambassador. Ambassador. Um, and. There's just a lot of um, idealism and enthusiasm uh, about this, and really a lot of uh, MIT professors were willing to go. And you see, uh, in retrospect, they did it at kind of a, a non-trivial personal cost that, that a lot of them, uh, a number of the people, especially I, I know of at MIT, and so th you know they, were, they thought this was something that was important, and they really, um, really uh, did it, and I think I don't know if your family had a lot of connections, but there were many, uh, I think, who had a lot of um, faculty and students at, MI, at uh, IIT Kanpur had a lot of uh, close connections with uh, American faculty. Faculty members, uh, yeah. that, uh, yes. Your experience? Yes, indeed, indeed mm -hmm. the case. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, their experience, you know, they had gone and lived in India, and they mm -hmm. had an experience in India, mm -hmm. and, and clearly that, uh, Gave them an understanding of uh, the culture, the people mm -hmm. that that uh, helped make it easier mm -hmm. for Indian graduate students, mm -hmm. uh, for Indian students from IIT to mm -hmm. come and study in places like MIT. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, what also helped is um, uh, the visa. Uh, policies mm -hmm. of the United States. So um, I, I don't know if it was during Kennedy or, mm. or Johnson yeah. that um, it became much more liberal. Mm. So it was relatively easy to get a visa to come here to study. Yeah. Yeah. So when the IITs, this program started, uh, the United States had very discriminatory uh, immigration policies that made it very difficult for a lot of Indians, for Indians to come to the United States. There were times where there was a limit of 100 uh, visas from India that would be allowed, and so, so there wasn't really any expectation almost that any Indians would come to the United States. There wasn't any, uh, that wasn't really seen as a possibility, and then in 1965 the immigration laws changed to make it possible for, for Indians to stay, and then that, that happened. And, and so if we, if we come to today now, and what, what do you think, um, you know, so a lot of this happened in the 60s and, and the 70s. Mm -hmm. What do you think today is the connection between IITs, MIT, and, and uh, IT industry, both Silicon Valley and Bangalore? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, my, I, I'm not, you might all be better equipped to answer this than I am, but just in. You're a historian. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so I, I talk about the past and not the present, but um, <laughs> uh, if I, and I guess I'd say if uh, knowing about the past, you know, gives you any qualifications to know about the future, I would be um, much richer than I am. But, um, <laughs> but um, my sense is just in visiting at the I, IITs that there's not, a lot, there's a lot of opportunities in India that didn't exist in uh, maybe the time that you were graduating from IIT Kanpur, and that the, the, uh, the connections uh, maybe to graduate schools in the United States are maybe not as, as 
strong or compelling that everyone doesn't feel they need to go to American graduate school or even that their future uh, rests in, in America, which, um, yeah, and you know, with the presence of very many, uh, many American multinationals in Bangalore and so on, gives a lot of opportunities. You can go and work at Google, Google or Microsoft. In Bangalore, yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I guess what is also very important is while, while the IITs were very critical in the early stage mm. um, in India because of, of uh, the English, because of the British, had, had developed really a, a, a fairly broad system of, of very good universities. It's, it wasn't mm. just the IITs. Mm. Yeah. And, and then India has really continued to build on that. I mean, um, with a number of universities, I mean, you see many. Um, and when I um, look, was looking at the um, Indian graduates of MIT, I mean, there are many IIT graduates who go to MIT, but there are many who are from other schools as well. And there, there is a complete ecosystem of a lot of talent in India. Uh, and uh, I don't know if it's completely pol politic to say it, but you know, other than at the IITs and uh, in India, that there's a lot of great engineering talent. And, and you met some of the IIT students who are now professors at MIT, Arvind, and, mm. and others. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so what, what's um, you know? T we'll wrap it up, and then we'll we'll take some questions. Mm. Um, what's what's the sort of lesson learned here? Mm. And um, does this apply to other developing countries? And this was one revolution. There are other revolutions in, uh, that go beyond. So for example, there was information technology. Mm -hmm. uh, are there other kinds of uh, lessons to be learned for other yeah. uh, phases? Yeah. I mean, I guess so one of the things I think that we see about India was, I mean, that there were often two tendencies in India. I think one to look globally and look all around the world and look for best practices. And one was to just try to focus on India and try to look narrowly. And I think the inclination to look globally and look at best practices was what uh, ultimately uh, dominated and has been, a been very uh, instrumental in helping India uh, grow technologically and bringing a lot of wealth to India that had they, India just decided or focused completely on itself, I mean, again, there was, were criticisms that maybe they should have, MIT wasn't the right model and they should have a, universities, technical universities that were focused on more indigenous, sort of low. Um, skills. Yeah, low. Technical skills. Low, yeah. um, you, you know, appropriate technology as they, they um, used to describe it as. Um, you know, I don't think you'd have the same effect today. So ultimately in the long term that was a very, uh, wise strategy and um, the people who uh, you know were involved in it maybe didn't get to see completely the benefits of, of what happened and I don't know if other countries could do it and again it took such a long time to um, to happen and I don't know the same possibilities uh, India has sort of had the advantage of being one of the first countries to really lay out this strategy over 50 years and, and the Opportunity. So clearly, the uh, the computer industry in India is in very early stages, mm. and and um, you still don't, you know, in very early stages of product development mm. and and going after, you know, the indigenous market, mm. and and so India has had an advantage, which is. Um, uh, we could leapfrog. Mm. We we didn't have to. We could skip. Uh, faces and just jump, mm -hmm. like for example, from landlines to cell phones. Mm -hmm. And so I would say a lot of people here would agree that the the mobile phone infrastructure in India is is better than here. I live in Portola Valley. I don't have uh, cell phone coverage. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, one of the things that I've enjoyed when I, I take the train from Delhi to Kanpur. Uh, speaking on the mo my mobile phone with my wife in the you know fields, and uh, it's quite remarkable to uh, be able to do that again with better coverage than uh, I have in my office, uh, two miles away from my wife. Yeah. <laughs> but one other thing, just about this, is that I think India developed 
in IT with an understanding of American technologies and understanding where India could leverage its strengths um, that they didn't try to replicate you know, the hardware industry, a semiconductor industry, that, that really wouldn't have been an area where India could and leverage just, just its... Just the level of investment was yeah. prohibitive. And, yeah. But they saw, you know, software really had the advantages where they could le leverage that. Good, good. So we have a, a whole deck of questions. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm going to pick the first one from my friend uh, C. Mohan, who represents... Where is Mohan? Uh, <laughs> right there, right there. And so Mohan is a, is a fellow at, uh, at IBM. Mm -hmm. And so he takes issue to my comment that IBM was dumping old computers <laughs> at IIT. <laughs> I, I, have a, I have a bias here, so why don't you take that question? Well, I mean, well, thanks a lot for <laughs> I think this is a no-win situation, so I don't know who I have to decide who I want to alienate. Um, uh, but, I mean, it's, I think there are a lot of complicating factors. I'm not quite, quite sure. Uh, you know, something. Mike was a very specific point that IIT Madras got a 370. Model, 370 yeah. 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 I wasn't trying to in general say that. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so one of the, the points uh, of that we didn't quite cover and uh, we were focused a lot on IIT Kanpur was uh, that um, IIT Madras in 1972 uh, made an agreement through the West German government to get a, a, a state-of-the-art, top-of-the-line IBM 370 computer, and then they brought down a number of the faculty from IIT Kanpur to run it, and that um, IIT Madras became one of the leading centers of computing and computing education um, based on that computer and these people from uh, Mahabala and uh, Muthu Krishnan from uh, from IIT Kanpur. And, and I think, was it Suha? So someone from uh, Karakpur is also pointing out that the IBM 1620, when it came to Karakpur, was actually the Same. current generation. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. Well, probably Kanpur was, was the victim here. Well, OK, uh, IBM, you win. Yeah. <laughs> and it, um, it is interesting that um, the IBM 1620 was the computer that many American uh, engineering students got their introduction to computing on, and then also many of the students at IIT, Kragpur and Kanpur, uh, got their introduction on. So they, there's a number of uh, Indians and Americans who had the same experience on these uh, computers. And, and so one of, the, one of the members of the audience is pointing out that uh, Professor Mahabala, who was at Kanpur, subsequently went to Madras and mm -hmm. was the head of the computer department mm -hmm. there. Um, so, so I have a, a, an interesting question, and this, this is um, the perspective of the, of the person here is that um, only 10% of the IT graduates stay in science and engineering. Mm. A lot of the others go to business and finance. Mm. And, and marketing. I'm, I'm a marketing person. I'm chief marketing officer of Iron Mountain. Mm -hmm. And so uh, should IIT, IIT didn't have any business. So uh, there was a different set of schools mm -hmm. in Institute of Management. Mm -hmm. and, and so should IIT have had education in yeah. business and finance? Mm -hmm. I think uh, many of them do now. I know IIT Kanpur does, and I think IIT uh, Bombay does, and, and I guess, I mean, that trend is true also among American engineers, so I don't know. Uh, I think you have uh, financial engineering being very popular among uh, MIT PhD engineers and so on, so I think it, it is just a, a trend that is happening, you know, happens. Um, so one, one more, and this is the last one on IBM. So <laughs> another person points out that IBM was technically not thrown out of India. Um, Indira they Gandhi just choice. insisted that uh, that India o uh, have 51 percent ownership. Yeah. Point <laughs> taken. <laughs> so, so Ramesh Babu is an IIC grad as uh, as a question about Indian Institute of Science, mm. and and there's a very similar question about uh, uh, other institutes other than MIT. Um, so, uh, Indian Institute of Science in, in Bangalore. Bangalore is again top, perhaps mm -hmm. less for engineering, more for science. Mm -hmm. uh, any any thoughts on on how important IIC was in the development of uh, IT industry? Well, so yeah, I mean, I I mean, I think it provided a lot of 
top flight scientists for India and there's a lot of, um, it, it seems to be one of the most attractive places for uh, researchers that, um, and then it had a, a major supercomputer system that um, Professor Rajaraman came down to, uh, to, to, to uh, lead. I guess I'm not exact, it, and it's become uh, one of the places I think now where you see some of the um, model of, you know, Stanford of uh, professor entrepreneurs that there's a, another uh, MIT graduate, uh, Vijay Chandru, who's started some uh, both IT and now uh, biotech companies. So it's been very important in that way, not quite in the same way that the IITs have been. So, so this questioner asks, how, how are IITs positioned now? And, and are, they, are they still going to have, it's something we talked about, are they still going to have the same impact? <laughs> yeah. So again, I'm a history professor, so um, if I, if I, so um, once uh, I can tell you about everything after, before, that happened before 8.15 today, but um, anything that, uh, after that is, um, I'm not very good at. But I mean, I think, um, so one of the challenges of the IITs, I think they've been great undergraduate institutions to be um, the sort of research-centric uh, kind of university institutions like uh, MIT, Stanford, Berkeley, it, they certainly aspire to that, but that has been, I think, one of their big challenges. And so whether they can do that and be the engines of entrepreneurship, I think is a, a big challenge. I think there's some efforts. I know um, like Professor uh, Junjanwala at IIT Madras mm -hmm. has a group that's doing a lot in that area, but that's one of the big challenges that they face, I think. In a, a number of people uh, asking about, are we, are we overemphasizing the importance of MIT? Mm -hmm. And there are four or five questions. And one of them asks, why is it that you don't have a lot of Indians in, in the Boston area? You yeah. really have a lot here in Silicon Valley. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, it, am I, are we overstating? Yeah. Well, I mean, so it does seem uh, um, that there is this migration, some polarization, I think, um, from uh, among Indians, and I've talked to a number of people about this, you know, from Boston um, to uh, Silicon Valley. But I guess what I, I'm interested in and thinking about is really, again, over the 20th century, and even, um, particularly um, during the time when most Indians went, returned to India, that uh, MIT um, played an important role. That I mentioned this, and I guess now would be a time that, to, to talk to say this, that um, India, MIT just had this um, cachet among uh, I Indians, a, a very strong level, especially in the um, 40s, 50s, and 60s, but even um, from there on, that I have a friend who uh, went to Harvard, and he had a, an Indian roommate at Harvard, and um, this Indian roommate uh, reported that his family members who were back in India were so proud that they had a member of their family who went to school near MIT. And they, um, <laughs> so I mean, that's um, s sort of, uh, <laughs> you know, w what it's been like. And I, so, so another, um, another question, a questioner, Anusha asks, you know, someone asked about uh, finance and, and uh, management. So she asks about liberal arts and fashion. You think there will be an IIT of fashion? <laughs> um, so if you, if you may please compare the development of Silicon Valley and Bangalore. So, so really um, uh, uh, people who, uh, who, who've been to Bangalore for the first time are just totally amazed. Mm. And, and like you said, you know, 20 years back, mm -hmm. it was probably a place like, um, like uh, Beaverton, Oregon, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, how, how do you see the two? Yeah, so that would be, I think, a, a session in itself. I mean, obviously, it seems like Bangalore has developed uh, much more quickly than, than Silicon Valley in, you know, fifth, you know the, the real fast growth phase has been in, you know, 20, you know, 20 years that um, it ha has been 
Um, and I, I'm not quite sure if I can completely address that, do justice to that in the, in the time, but um, it's, uh, it's would be worth another session. So, so we, we said a lot of uh, positive things about IIT. Mm. What, um, uh, what were the negative things about IIT? We talked about one, the brain drain. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, clearly there was a uh, sense of elitism mm. uh, with, with IIT graduates. Mm -hmm. And what, any, any, any other sort of? Yeah, well, I guess, I mean, it is, uh, you do see, I guess, in the IITs, I mean, um, I, I guess it does point out, I mean, not that this is about the IITs itself, that I think uh, India still needs to do work in, you know, primary education, universal education, that that's uh, a big issue that I think in the early days, especially of the IITs, that the people who were able to benefit were people from uh, middle class families who, uh, where you, uh, already had a very good education, and so they weren't, in that sense, uh, really agents of mobility. And I think the issue of education is still a big one in, in, in India in terms of primary and uh, universal education. Mm -hmm. um, th this question of um, uh, us, and maybe if you can, um, if you recall the dates, one suggests a kind of a chronology of how the IIT started, mm -hmm. kind of uh, approximately when. Yeah, so well, the first one was IIT uh, Kharagpur, and then um, sort of, uh, then IIT Bombay was the second one, and then IIT Madras, I believe, was uh, then IIT Kanpur, and uh, IIT Delhi started out as a, not as an IIT, but then was uh, changed to an IIT and uh, be became uh, that. Uh, Kharagpur started about uh, seven or eight years before the other one zone. So 50, I'm thinking 53 or 54 was when IIT Kharagpur, Kharagpur was, started. was started out. And, and what about Bombay? And so Bombay, I think, so they just celebrated their golden um, jubilee, I think 58, 59, then uh, Kanpur 60, 60 61. One. So Madras is a little a bit before that. Okay. So. Um, this this question asks, um, and so this is this is uh, m many of us who went to the five IITs um, have a bias about this. What do you think about you know IITs are now spreading, mm -hmm. and uh, they, you slap a new label on an old yeah. institution, call it an IIT. IIT. Yeah. Uh, what uh, you've spoken to a lot of. Uh, uh, former students, former yeah. faculty members, do you have a perspective on, on is that a good thing? Is, yeah. is the brand, um, you know, is it getting diluted and uh, yeah. tarnished? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't, it does, you know, in visiting the IITs, I mean, what, I mean, you see, it seems like the IITs have difficulty providing a faculty for the, the, uh, I guess seven IITs that there are now that um, that they have difficulty maintaining high quality faculty, and you know it does seem like it's going to be a challenge to maintain the same quality with another seven IITs. So uh, it, it does seem like that's um, going to be a, a big challenge um, that they're going to have to maintain the quality of, of that. And and it's really, you know, um, IITs had. Um, uh, a, a set of um, curriculum processes, mm. uh, systems, mm. and uh, it, I, I'm not, I, I just not familiar with how it is in Bhubaneswar and uh, yeah. Roorkee, I think, yeah. and all of these places. Yeah. But yeah, I guess what I say, I mean, it's remarkable that India kept the IITs together as a brand, you know, that they, you could imagine a scenario where each one is seen quite a bit differently, but you know what people see is the IITs, and so it doesn't, you know, IIT Kanpur, Kharagpur, uh, Ma you know, Madras, Bombay, and Delhi, for 50 years were kept together and together. identified as a. As and a brand. and I heard that they were trying to start IITs in Malaysia, hmm. and, and it's a kind of a franchising business yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we talked a lot about IIT Kanpur, I guess, because that's the only one I'm familiar with. Mm. Um, was there anything different, uh, this questioner asked, about that and their academic philosophy from the other IITs? Uh, well, I mean, there was, but ultimately I would say that 
they all the IITs converged on the same model that just to give one example that IIT Madras was started by the Germans and the Germans had a very heavy emphasis on um, uh, manual work that uh, they were the machines machine and made and, yeah. and so I don't know yeah. if any of you are <laughs> Madras graduates who did machine shop work for uh, a, a long time that uh, so Kanpur and taking you know the MIT model uh, you know, sort of minimize that sort of thing. We're incapable of, of screwing a bulb. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I mean, each, each one started it with their own distinctive characteristics, and then over time they converged on something similar. Yeah. Um, so we, we talked a little bit about this, but um, somehow the IT industry in, in India uh, almost exclusively grew in, in certain areas not across all of the computers, so there's no semiconductor, very mm. little hardware, mm. very little uh, of those kinds of mm. things. Mm. And, and so any, is, it, is it just the cost of equipment? Yeah, I mean, I think there, w there were efforts to do semiconductors. There was a plant made in Chandigarh and uh, some, um, and uh, Gulu uh, here, uh, uh, Advani had been to semi, worked at Fair, uh, at, um, semiconductor companies in, in the uh, Silicon Valley and went to them. I mean, it really, and computer technology, I think it would have been just impossible for them to keep, for India to keep up with the, the pace of technological change, the capital intensiveness of, of hardware, um, to have markets big enough. And again, there were efforts that didn't really succeed. And I think it was, you know, ultimately wise and sort of understanding that global ecosystem. Just like the Indian supercomputer and mm, so forth. Yeah. But uh, it was understanding the global ecosystem that that wasn't an area where they would be able to compete effectively, but they could compete effectively in software. Good. I have two more questions. Um, now we're going to switch to politics. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so this question I asked with Nikki Haley and Bobby Jindal. <laughs> um, establishing themselves as perhaps the most prominent Indo-Americans. Mm -hmm. is, is there now a shift taking place from technology to other fields for Indians here in the US? Well, I mean, I do think, I mean, it does seem that uh, there is, uh, that's beyond my, uh, <laughs> beyond my capability. But I mean, I, I, you do see, I mean, that in, uh, Indo-Americans have just um, and it's sort of natural to uh, be involved in every area of life in America, and you know, so it's it's natural whether it's that that um, or you know any other area, whether it's um, you know uh, you know any other area. So it's I think it's just a natural thing. So the the final question, I'll, I'll let you. Ask. I'll, I'll let you answer it also. No, thank you. So this is which is the best IIT, so uh, I... Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really an honor and, and a pleasure for me to have spent uh, time this whole week with you. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to see so many people. I'm a, I'm a Thai charter member. Mm. I'm, I'm pleased to see so many people from Thai. And, and it's just the amazing work that, that you're doing. So well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm very honored to be here. Well, I just want to thank you all. It's been a pleasure uh, talking to Ravi. And then I appreciate all of you coming. It's been a joy. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ravi. Thank you. Uh, it's a wonderful job as a moderator. And Ross, thank you to you. I want to say just uh, one other word of thank you and then a couple of quick announcements. Uh, Kiran Malhotra, who is the executive director of Thai, has been extremely helpful in setting this up. And I just want to say thank you, Kiran, because it's been terrific to work with you during this. Um, you know, this has been a couple of remarkable nights because we looked at the history of the, of the uh, MOS semiconductor um, on Tuesday night with Les Videz and Lou Terman and David Hodges. Andy Grove was here in the audience. Uh, tonight we had the grandson of Nehru's good friend and uh, the first director of the uh, precursor of the IITs and Vish Mishra and Suhas Patil. Gio Wiederhold is in the audience here. Now, Ross, you're the catalyst for all of this and it's the fact that you're here this week that those uh, pretty remarkable things happen. So 
I just want you to know how much we appreciate that. These two uh, lectures will be on our YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash computer history. We have our own branded channel. This will be the 82nd and 83rd programs that we have up there. I hope you'll go and see those uh, in about a week. Uh, I hope you have signed up for our next program Wednesday night. Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook, will be here with David Kirkpatrick, the author of the best-selling new book, The Facebook Effect. It's now oversubscribed, so if you haven't signed up, I apologize, but we probably won't be able to cram you into a room that's sure to be full of people. Uh, we'll have another event in August, we'll be, which will be another event in our um, um, Net at 40 series as we look back on 40 years of everything that led to the Internet. So we're delighted to have you here. And let me just say one other word that, um, Robbie, we've got a small gift for you. It's a copy of this book, Core Memory, which is uh, a memento of some of the best things in the museum photographed by a great young photographer named Mark Richards. And we're going to present that to you as a token of our thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, everyone, and good night.